Warmest greetings, everyone, and welcome to the 27th International Interdisciplinary and Conference on the Environment. My name is Greg Cronin, and I am the president of the Interdisciplinary Environmental Association. I come to you from unceded territory of the Ka, Sioux, Asage, Potawatomi, Kaskaskia, Pawnee, and Kickapoo Nations, currently known as Kansas. Several other nations also traverse this land before colonization. I acknowledge their millennia of stewardship of this beautiful land I now call home. I want to thank the Interdisciplinary Environmental Association and Birmingham Southern College for hosting this conference. I also thank Olivia Quezon, Amy Erickson, and Bill Holt for all their efforts in putting together an exciting agenda this year. Even though our conference is virtual, which means we have attendees from all corners of our shared planet, we want to honor Birmingham, Alabama as its geographic focus. The theme of this year's conference is Living in the Anthropocene, Challenges, Constraints, and Opportunities. The Anthropocene refers to the fact that the environmental challenges discussed over the next few days are largely driven by humans. However, it is equally true that the opportunities will also be driven by humans. In his 2010 book, Living Through the End of Nature, Professor Paul Wapner wrote, quote, The end of nature changes our historical role on Earth to the degree that it calls on, calls on us to consciously take hold of the steering wheel of life and become intelligent, compassionate, and otherwise mindful managers of the planet. Quite a daunting challenge, end quote. Our conference focuses on these challenges and achieving a relationship with nature that honors humanity, all species, and Mother Earth. This beautiful design on my t-shirt, I hope you can see it here, comes from BSC student Alana Morchauer, which shows human hands supporting two endangered species of Alabama entwined with the Mobile River Basin, known as the as America's Amazon. Of course, art can have many interpretations, but in describing her creation, Miss Morchauer wrote, quote, not only does the design refer reference biodiversity and species found in the state, but it also provides representation of the many people of color who are actively working on the front lines to combat environmental racism and climate change. The message makes it apparent that environmental justice can best be attained through collective action while empowering communities and holding the people in power accountable. Our present and future depend on it." End quote. Thank you, Alana, for your honest, truthful, and brave message. Students like you give me hope for a better future for our planet. I too want to speak honestly, truthfully, and bravely about humanity and the environment. My message today is very personal and should be attributed solely to me. My worldview is shaped by being a white, able-bodied, cis-heterosexual American male and all the unearned privileges that accompany being a member of those groups. Born in 1966, I did not witness the civil rights movement, nor was I taught about it in school or by my family. However, during my personal journey to be a champion of justice, I learned about the events that took place in Birmingham, Alabama, and their role in racial justice legislature. It is fitting that this conference with a large focus on environmental justice is being held in Birmingham because environmental justice is a civil right. In Alabama, in the United States, and across the globe, black, indigenous people of color disproportionately suffer from environmental problems that they played little role in creating. 
my message is one that comes from being raised as a dominant member in a racially unjust society, transitioning to being non-racist, and then being tremendously saddened and even angered by the racial and environmental injustices that I witnessed during my work in Haiti. It took years of working hand in hand with black indigenous people of color before I made the conscious decision to become an anti-racist, to actively combat racism and environmental injustice. White people devoted to racial justice are sometimes called white allies or white accomplices if doing the ethically correct thing falls outside the law. After all, genocide and slavery were often canonized within the legal structure of the dominant group. Being a white ally does come with costs, but those costs are minor compared to the cost that our black, indigenous, people of color, brothers and sisters suffer on a daily basis. So with this address, I attempt to give advice on being a good, effective white ally. For black indigenous people of color listening right now, please accept my sincere apology for not including you in the audience. However, if you do listen and have any feedback for me, please know that I will listen and respond graciously. My hope is that Lessons learned from my personal journey can help others become allies or accomplices in less time than it took me. My evolution took far too long. It's certainly not finished and probably never will be. I found that during challenging times, you can gain strength from a heroic historical figure. And when it comes to white allyship, I look to abolitionist John Brown for that inspiration and strength. So I'm going to be talking a, a lot about John Brown. Um, he led the anti-slavery efforts not far from where I sit now that are commonly referred to as Bleeding Kansas. John Brown emphatically stated, stated that enslaving black people in America is wrong, and he paid the ultimate price for his allyship. I was born on the 107th anniversary of John Brown's execution at the hands of the U.S. government. You might be familiar with the Civil War marching song, John Brown's Body. It goes something like, John Brown's body lies a moldering in the grave. John Brown's body lies a moldering in the grave. John Brown's body lies a moldering in the grave. But his soul goes marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. And so on. I'm not going to make you suffer through me singing the entire song. But I did want you to know that even though you might not recall the name of John Brown, you probably have heard that song before. And that is the man that the song refers to is the one that I'm going to be talking about quite a bit. Now, as a child growing up in Kansas, I attended many John Brown jamborees in Osawatomie, Kansas, without knowing or really caring who John Brown was. The 12-year-old 12 12-year-old 12 version of me just cared about riding the Ferris wheel, eating cotton candy, and chasing a greased hog. Um, at the time, I was unaware that the John Brown jamboree took place on the land where the first shots of the U.S. Civil War were fired. Fast forward three decades and I find myself working in Haiti, where the main road in the capital city of Port-au-Prince is called John Brown Boulevard. Um, my work in Haiti helped me realize that history and colonization are intricately linked to environmental health and environmental justice. One thing that we can do as allies is to stop blaming the victims of colonization for the conditions that they find themselves in. 
I cringe every time somebody calls Haiti the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere or blames Haiti's current conditions on things like political corruption. The truth is that Haiti has one of the richest cultures and histories in the world. The rich Taina culture called that island Aiti when Columbus arrived in 1492. Europeans brought along with them genocide and slavery over the next centuries until the Haitian Revolution created a free and independent republic in 1804. The fallout from this colonization continues today, not from the fault of Haitians, but as a consequence of racial injustice. I see Haiti as an incredibly rich country in terms of the character of people, its history, its culture, but she is also a victim of racial oppression that has resulted in incredible environmental and economic degradation. Blaming colonization for Haiti's current state has caused some people to accuse me of suffering from white guilt. I personally think that guilt is a poor motivator. It is for me anyway. I am motivated in Haiti by the potential for justice, fairness, and happiness. I remember a TED talk given a couple of years ago by an indigenous woman who I paraphrase with, none of us are to blame for the history of colonization or the actions of our ancestors, but we are all responsible for how we move forward. Um, and that, that really spoke to me. Um, also, a DNA analysis shows that my ancestry is complex and that I have grandparents from England, Ireland, East Europe, North Africa, Nigeria, and Kenya. I can guess from these broad groups that my ancestors included both oppressors and the oppressed. Though I come from my ancestors, I'm not responsible for their actions. What I focus on now is making a better world for my descendants and for your descendants. A golden rule of allyship is to listen to and believe the testimony of oppressed people. When black indigenous people of color share that they have been oppressed and are being oppressed for decades, believe them and react as you would if uh, any family member of your family was being abused. I believe white allies should do what they can to learn about racial injustice and understand that it is not the job of black indigenous people of color to educate you. They have enough to struggle with in their daily lives to take on the additional task of teaching you about racial injustice, environmental injustice. So read books, watch TED Talks, documentaries, visit museums, visit historic sites, and put the burden of educating yourself on you, not on, on other people. Uh, now, yesterday... I was a total hypocrite by breaking a rule of white allyship, of not making unreasonable requests to an indigenous person. Um, I made this request to my dear friend, uh, Taino Bahike Miguel Sege, to give a, a, made a last minute request for him to give a land acknowledgement and an indigenous prayer to start our conference. And... Miguel was wonderful in, um, in offering to do this despite the, the short notice. And so he will do this prayer after my uh, presentation here. Um, I just want this to be a very quick greeting and introduction, but I really consider that the start of the conference to be Miguel's um, prayer and acknowledgement. I met Miguel at the last IICE in Puerto Rico, or what the Taino call the island of Boracan. Our friendship has grown over the years. We visited Taino sites together and shared ceremony. Um, we're bringing the Taino resurgence movement to Haiti. Um, <clears throat> we even visited John Brown's cabin together. 
and he performed the wedding ceremony between my Haitian Taino wife and me. So um, I consider him a brother from another mother, and I am glad that you had the opportunity to learn from his wisdom today. But before Miguel takes the stage, I want to ask you all to send prayers and healing, healing energy to another member of the IEA family. Adam Briggle is an innovative environmental field philosopher and a great role model. In an incredible display of caring humanity, Professor Briggle is donating a kidney today. So may the donor and the recipient have speedy, complete recoveries and future good health. So I will thank you very much for being here, and I hope you have a wonderful international interdisciplinary conference on the environment.